This is the second session in our new series. The series is called Coping with Reality. Can philosophy help? We are going to discuss the concept of the philosophical order and the meaning of terms like metaphysics, epistemology, ethics, and politics. Tonight's topic is the philosophical order. We will play a short video by myself, John, and Ronan Grunberg, and then move on to the discussion. Ronan, can you play the video, please? Okay. Well, yes, actually, just like last time, uh, Ronan has suggested some very interesting further questions for discussion. Um, Ronan, I have to say, looking at those questions and the ones last time, that you are really a really expert educator, I have to say. Well, I, I, <laughs> sorry. yeah, well, John, I, I appreciate that. Uh, that's That comes from uh, teaching high school students for 30 years. Uh, you have to come up with interesting questions for them to uh, bite into. I taught, I taught in university uh, up to PhD level for 47 years. Right. I still can't think of it. Thank you, Ron. And I feel like I'm a teenager now, like in high school. <laughs> well, listen, there's something to be said for being a teenager. Don't knock it. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I just, I, I seriously did want, want to give you that compliment, Ronan, because that's a skill. And it's I appreciate skill, that. Which I, as a pseudo uh, educator, do not possess. So there, there are about 12 or 13 uh, <clears throat> questions uh, all together on, um, uh, uh, on, on, the, uh, on the YouTube channel. And obviously, we can only discuss a few. And Ale is going to keep us to time, uh, as we say. Uh, let me kick off. Um, uh, uh, Henry is going to be first anyway, regardless of what the question is. But let me just <laughs> set, the, set, the question, uh, set the question off. And, and this is question that Ronan asked, it said that Etienne Gilson, and I guess this was the central issue that we were talking about, argued that the love of wisdom or philosophy should be prior to all the other disciplines. I mean, it should serve as the kind of foundational pursuit upon which all the other areas of knowledge rest. So in this age of specialization and so-called experts, how can we strike a balance between, you know, cultivating expertise in one field or another specific field? And on the other hand, uh, nurturing a deep love for wisdom uh, as the guiding force behind our, our pursuits. And so, uh, Henry, um, you're up. Yes, I just. I was wondering, because you mentioned that uh, determinism is an extreme part of materialism. Am I correct? Uh, you, you're muted, John. Yes, it's, it's, it's sort of a, it's an end game of uh, materialism. Well, uh, it just puzzled me because, in my opinion, uh, determinism is totally opposite to materialism completely opposite, it has nothing to do with materialism. And I can prove it actually. This is why I don't understand what's the basis uh, under this statement. Well, what, what is understood by determinism is that sort of everything is kind of uh, predetermined, you know, that uh, it's the law of causality that, uh, you know, and uh, the idea is that there isn't a kind of another element. There isn't a spiritual or non-material element in the world. Yeah, I understand what it is, but uh, what I, can, I would like to say that determinism uh, is a domain of metaphysics. Determinism means I believe, I believe, I'm a determinist, that everything that happens or might happen is predetermined, right? So what is it? Uh, materialism implies empirical basis. There is nothing empirical related with determinism. It's the pure metaphysics. It's mysticism. Okay. Can I make a point uh, quickly, if you don't mind, John? Yes, yeah, so please, please. Yeah. Um, I think we need to distinguish between fate and determinism. So fate is where, you know, your life is sort of given to you ahead of time. Like 
the Oedipal story. You know, you know, he was told what his fate would be. Uh, but determinism is a little different. It's based on causality. And the argument there is that in the material world, everything is ante antecedently caused. So there's nothing that we do that actually happens without a cause. There is no such thing as an uncaused event. Uh, as well, you know, even our thoughts and our actions, they're all caused by uh, sort of material causes that we are not in control of. And that's why it's uh, we are determined. Uh, may I comment on that, Rob? Yes, I totally agree. There is a cause. But the problem is, in most of the situations, we don't know what the cause is. True. We don't know, we don't know what the cause of our uh, thoughts. We don't know what the cause is. So basically, again, we are losing here the empirical part. We don't know what the cause Yes, absolutely. I totally agree. There is a cause. But the problem is, do we know the cause of, the, of events? Do we know what caused it? And this is the problem. And this is the problem. This is why I don't see the connection with materialism. Materialism implies that we know. We know what causes it. But in case of determinism, we have an issue with this. I, I think generally um, in the age of science, in, in the world that we live in today, and listen, I, I don't agree with it personally. I'm I'm with you. I think you're suggesting that there is freedom, and I believe there is freedom. But I think that um, science would argue that everything is ca causally determined, and that ultimately there is no such thing as free will. Um, that that is all illusory. Um, you know, there is definitely lots of arguments against that, and you know, I would actually hold. Uh, that that is not the case, you know, that we are determined. But I, I think, uh, you know, if you ask a neurologist, for example, who believes in science and in causality, he would say that all our thoughts, all our actions are determined and that we we are not really free, even though we think we are. Yeah, the, the thing is, yes, maybe, yeah, maybe. No, no question about it. Maybe it's determined, but... Do you know this? And we are going back to Immanuel Kant and Schopenhauer and even, even David Hume because the things in themselves, we have no means to know the things in themselves and we have to define them using our senses and our interpretation of things. So it's, it's directly related to determinism. And again, so... Well, so, 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 is so uh, thanks, a, thanks a lot, Henry. So you see what I mean about Ronan being a good educator. That's what I was trying to say, Ronan. Yeah. You see what I was doing, Henry, was taking for granted the kind of uh, current scientific uh, debate. Like just recently, there's been a revival of interest in determinism and a guy from Stanford or somewhere announced that, uh, you know, determinism is true. The implication from an ethical point of view is that, you know, there is no free will, that there's no choice. That's that's the thing that most people think about. And uh, as I said in the video, um, I, I disagree with that. Um, by the way, one of the questions that Ronan asked in these questions is precisely that. Um, it's uh, it, it, uh, one, precisely, is there a danger of, uh, uh, is there, is the, how does the emphasis on determinism impact our sense of responsibility as human beings? And maybe we can sort of return to exactly that discussion um, sort of later on. Um, uh, sorry, I guess you're on the, we're back to the, the first question, remember, was this notion of uh, meta philosophy being foundational and how can we uh, reconcile, uh, you know, this notion of, uh, of philosophy being important um, with our age of specialization where we're all experts, supposedly. Right. <laughs> right. And all I just really want to say about that is it's almost a, a kind of a small point, but in a way it's a it's a, a bigger point at the same time, is that uh, to encourage interdisciplinary studies and, you know, interdisciplinary studies can almost be a code name for philosophy in general, if, especially if you think of philosophy as uh, uh, the the uh, the the method of inquiry or in inquiring into the nature of reality. But 
uh, I think today one of the problems with like that your first question brings up is the specialization and the expertise of a very diversified field of of sciences now all kinds of very focused disciplines you know even within the larger disciplines of psychology or biology there's you know the organic biology and there's molecular uh, animal biology and there's you know ecological all kinds of specializ specialized disciplines but that that very specialization has as as the question implies has kept people from an integrated and interdisciplinary view and i think the interdisciplinary view um is really the route to uh, realizing philosophy is the beginning of all inquiry and 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 all all uh you know greater knowledge um so and and there's there's really professional uh resistances to being interdisciplinary you know i mean even in economics if you start talking about possibly you know social sociological explanations or class class consciousness or something like that you're not considered an economist or if you start talking about psychological motivations you know not in outside of the mainstream utilitarian psychology you're considered you know not an economist so there's there's these sort of professional uh resistances to being interdisciplinary if you know you're only a, an official economist or a psychologist or a you know physicist if you only look at these one your own discipline and be uh uh given credit for that by your peers and that's the second thing i wanted to bring up though i i'm not you know i there's uh you know you have this order of metaphysics epistemology ethics and politics um but i and i'm very much in a pro interdisciplinary in uh but um there's kinds of knowledge there's sort of general kinds of knowledge and one of them is and aristotle makes this distinction that makes ethics almost the beginning of philosophy because in the sense what we're doing when we're speaking in these groups and debating metaphysical issues about what's real or you know philosophical order of thinking like you're putting forth here is we're we're in communication with each other and already that's a that's an f that's that's before anything else that's that's an ethical relationship we're we're you know we're we're kind of committed to saying the truth to each other and we're not trying to deceive each other um where you know the communication that gives rise to knowledge uh and the in the community that holds any knowledge that might be produced by one or several people in the community it's a communicative interpersonal relational uh aspect so philosophy doesn't exist in so to speak with you know robinson crusoe on an island all by uh, all by himself you know it's not an individual thing it's a collective discussion and right away you're in a ethical and even a political issue in fact the interdisciplinary uh approach to philosophy is also a political issue as i was talking about before uh different disciplines do not recognize somebody speaking for their discipline if they're coming from another discipline or they're trying to mix disciplines so anyway the point is um this order that you're talking about seems very uh physical material oriented and that uh for those kinds of sciences and it, it's it's overlooking this other kind of knowledge that for example aristotle talks about of ethical relations that you're in an ethical relation you know with another person you know we're a, we're a social being we're um it's not about trying to determine the the actual physical reality of something it's trying to determine this the situation you're in with this person and what, what we're trying to do it's a it's a it's an ethical uh you're, you're in ethical situations and it's it's not you're not trying to deal with some of these uh metaphysical issues of what is real what is real is 
what your 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 relationship with somebody else so um it's a different kind of it's a different kind of knowledge and you know ethical behavior is and you know to do what is right and what is wrong in a situation with other pe- people and it's it's not really what today we would consider scientific we don't need full research and exact certain proofs and deductions uh to to go forward when we're talking with other people and deliberating like we are in this group right now we don't need precise answers to every question we may think of or make sh- sure before we open our mouth what exactly is going on we we just we just do it on good faith so to speak and a commitment to you know treat each other with respect and say truthful things to each other so it's it's a different kind of kind of knowledge than say this this metaphysics epistemology ethics politics would is trying to you know set the foundation for so just those two points interdisciplinary and um sort of the non-empirical non-scientific knowledge of ethical relations that may in fact be the foundation for a, a philosophy in some sense so these are two good now how it is waiting but these are two good points that you've raised tori and i would just like to address like both of them in turn on the interdisciplinary thing uh you and i are very much on the same page that uh, you know on that that position um and uh if i can sort of i'm going to advertise my own institution york university uh, we try to do that. There were a bunch of us. I, I was someone that a- actually had contacts across the, the university in various uh, disciplines. And we had a group of us, with the, you know, we, we did PhDs in finance, we did PhDs in economics, we did PhDs in political science, and there would be a group of us that would be, be on the committees and philosophy itself. And there was a PhD in environmental studies as well. Yeah, and what we tried to do was deal with the issue regardless of what you actually call the degree like so for example my student Dancy Mendoza his his uh, his um, his thing was uh, it was three essays on money credit and philosophy it was about re- realism per totem diem but it's highly relevant to economics as Ala was just saying the other disciplines are a part of philosophy <laughs> not the other way around you, yeah. you know so I so I I I very much agree with that that point. Do you wanted to come back on that? No, that's fine. That's yeah. fine. Uh, on the other one, it's it, it's a slightly different point and a very good point from the uh, from the question that I asked. I was talking about philosophy being prior to the other, um, uh, you know, disciplines, right? Uh, right? The second question is within philosophy itself: is there a hierarchy. Um, right. Obviously, it is true that what we were doing at York was precisely we were respecting each other's disciplines. We weren't thinking ourselves as professor of finance, professor of economics, professor of political sciences. We were thinking ourselves of scholars in a community. Uh, it's, it's unique to us. I understand that if you go into the real academia, you know, you just get shut down. Uh, um, it, so, so so we're on the same page. The second point was slightly different, which is, um, is there an order within uh, philosophy itself, i.e. should you do your metaphysics first? The, the thing being that unless you know what the world is like, including the social world, um, you can't really make meaningful statements about epistemology, ethics, uh, you know, or politics. Now, interestingly enough, our very next session is on exactly that point. We're going to be elaborating on that point. And I've asked you, I hope that you're going to be the discussant. Uh, yes, I, I, yes, yeah, I plan to. Uh, on that session. Uh, I think we'll do it slightly differently uh, this time because, you know, you're in California. I think what we'll do is Ronan and I will have that discussion and then make you live a formal discussant. Okay. Where, where you can precisely address those issues that you were talking about. Is sure, it, sure, yeah. sure. We can work that out. Yeah. So, yeah, so everyone else, uh, you know, watch this space. The, the reason I want Tari to be the discussant on that next one is exactly the point that you just raised. Okay, good, good. Yeah. 
uh, sorry, how have we gone on a bit? But I just wanted to get those two things. Uh, how it? Yeah, um, uh, maybe three points. Um, one, I tend to think of philosophy as an orientation or a um, an attitude toward the world in terms of sort of rigorous questioning and uh, sort of uh, Ronan mentioned not taking things for granted or challenging assumptions or sort of a rigorous scrutiny of what it means to be alive. And that includes uh, some internal investigation, which might, which might be psychological and external uh, uh, examination, which might, which might be sociological. So I see as fundamental, I see philosophy as fundamentally a stubborn curiosity about what's around us, um, both internally and externally. Um, the second point is, I'm still not sure what the, pro what the, pro what the problem with the epistemological turn is. Um, you said something to the effect of you can't deal with the other stuff until you know what's most real. But how do you know what's most real until you know how you know it, right? So, you know, if I have a if I have a, um, a, a, a re religious orientation, come from a religious background, that might give me one way of looking into the world or investigating what's most real. If I practice meditation, um, that's, a me that's an epistemological methodology that will take me somewhere. If I'm, the question's about, you know, sensory perception and, and um, you know, um, logical reasoning and mathematics. Those are all fundamental ways of, knowing the world. And I, obviously we don't have to choose, you know, one over the other, but I don't know that we can know what's most real until we examine how we think we know what's most real. Um, third point. And, and so I'm curious about finding out more about the, the uh, critiques of the epistemological turn and why we have to put metaphysics at the forefront or how we can do that without examining our own ways of knowing. Um, the third thing is, and maybe that picks up off Tori, I'm kind of interested in, uh, socio in, in sociology. So there's, I noticed political and economic um, sort of as discrete sciences. I think sociology is pretty important to the philosophical project um, and understanding our culture. So Ronan uh, mentioned sort of self-awareness and scrutinizing our own responses and... Um, questioning our assumptions and i think one way into that is through examining uh, social relationships and culture so i don't know that i can get at a uh, i can get at a metaphysics with all without also considering um the sociology and the cultural environment and the symbolic universe into which i'm immersed and into which into which i've grown up so i prefer to rather than see things as a hierarchy i prefer and this is really rough to see things as sort of a constellation with the various uh, you know the various branches of philosophy informing them and i don't know really that there has to be a branch at the top and maybe at the center is is kind of well-being and you know aesthetics as an orientation toward the world um that allows us to know in specific ways and you know it's a sensibility but it, it might also be an epistemology or something so um i'm you know i'm drawn to the idea of a constellation and i'm not convinced that we need a hierarchical order um i think philosophy is a questioning and an orientation and um i might can i don't um i still i haven't found a way around the problem or i don't see why the ep epistemological turn is a problem and the final concluding point i think sociology and culture and understanding those are central to working through uh, philosophical problems including the metaphysical problem and i don't know how we can get there without uh, of those orientations john you're you're uh, muted you're muted john Perhaps it's the best thing for me to be muted. Really. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, I mean, actually, these are all very, very good questions, and they do lead, Howard, exactly to the sort of things that we are going to be discussing next time. You know what I mean? They're, 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 um, I, I try to unpack all the different things. I, on sociology, of course, I agree with you. Uh, you know, not only at York, but, I mean, also at Cambridge. Uh, you, know, my, you know my friend Jeff Ingham, who's 
I don't know what you call him, he's a sociologist, calls himself an economic sociologist. And he and I have very similar positions. And we would have uh, cross seminars, you know, with the sociologists, with the professors. And my own view is that the, yeah, this is technical thing in economics. There's a thing called microeconomics, neoclassical uh, microeconomics. I think that should be done away with altogether and replaced with a thing called economic sociology. Um, I think the reason that Alla put in her diagram and Alla can come in there, um, all the special sciences, the only reason we put three, and even we conflated two or three, that was just for space on the diagram. Like in principle, all of those special sciences, you know, there's infinity of special sciences on the diagram, physics itself, chemistry, sociology, as you say, and uh, aesthetics. Is a, it, it's one thing that I... Ronan stressed it in the talk. That's one thing I think is very important too. I think uh, that if we sort of take that sort of political economy approach, which is essentially what we began with, yeah, you miss out aesthetic. But, but I would put them all on the same level. Just uh, Ala, would you like to remark on that? Yeah, I support your kind of point and. <laughs> The old sciences, as you said, and philosophy. I don't know if you can say fair enough that it's put it not above, but in kind of more important um, place than those sciences. And again, um, the philosophy is kind of basic for sciences, not the other way around, as we mentioned, right? Mm. So, I mean, if there are many, many examples in the history, like that in science's history, that something was kind of taken as given, and then it's and it's a period that it's not true after all, right? So philosophy, it's more fundamental, if I can say, right? So science is kind kind of relay on, on philosophy, like. Or kind of proven philosophy in a way, if you can like put it that way. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and again, I we added philosophy. I don't know. We added well-being and psychology, which I didn't see much in any philosophical philosophy books. And considering like current kind of situation in philosophy, in politics, in history. I think well-being and psychology getting more and more importance in our lives, in our minds, and in our happiness and human flourishing in the end, if you see my my system. Mm -hmm. um, May I chime in for one yeah, second? I was just going to say that I, I want to bring you in, Ronan, uh, so you preempted just just uh howard in terms of um that hierarchical uh issue that you were having of, of, of putting metaphysics epistemology um yeah I, i'm not sure that a hierarchy is necessary but i i would say that what one of the issues today is that people fail to think about the metaphysics in the sense that they have what they think is a certain certain knowledge about about whatever it is in in science or in medicine they they think this is something we know unequivocally but of course all the knowledge that we have is based on our metaphysical um perception of what is real so you know it's like it underlies it like you said you know it depends on on your metaphysical position that's what you will you know assume as as knowledge or that's what the type of knowledge you'll you'll try to find but i i don't know that people are aware of that nuanced reality that there's a metaphysics that underlies the knowledge that they have so it's just more about making people aware that there, there's a foundation there and that you know you can't ignore it you can't forget it um you know it's it's uh vitally important to know um, that whatever it is that you think you know is based on something else. That is your metaphysical um, position. You may not be aware of it consciously, 
it may be an unconscious thing, uh, but it's it's still uh, a, a fundamental. It comes before knowledge. Um, so maybe it's less about having an ar- a hierarchy, but and more about having uh, awareness of all these different things. Um, yeah, I agree. That the philo- philosophical orientation is a curiosity about what's most true and what's most real, right? As a sort of as a sort of a state of mind or a way to approach the world. But I still think the way to get there is by examining our belief systems and how we arrived at them and where their vulnerabilities are. And I think that project is, might be prim- oh. uh, do, do primarily think, epistemological. Do you think that people do that, though? Do you think that in, in this world, people actually do what you're um, suggesting or arguing? I don't know. I mean, I think it's maybe it's an it's a nor, it's an ought rather than a than is, right? So you know, how do we, um, assuming that we want to get at the truth, what are the ways to do that? I mean, a lot of people just are so absorbed in their day to day lives and just trying to get by. They don't That's have the the time or the luxury to you know examine the philosophical the broader philosophical questions they might ask themselves. You know, does my boss really like me? Or is he just being nice? Or do I really like my boss? Or what's really going on in my workplace? Or um, is, you know, is my partner faithful or not? Those are sort of micro realities that people are trying to deal with, without necessarily, you know, examining free will or cosmology or, um, you know, whether if I tap the table, is is the table really solid? I mean, those are sort of esoteric ultimate questions of ultimate reality but people's everyday lives i think are immersed in the very real and trying to grapple with the very real um and often in terms of their kind of social relations or even uh, you know trying to if they get a diagnosis and they're trying to figure out what's going on inside my body um how sick am i uh, or you know what are the ways to do that those are again i think uh, yeah philosophy very real very real questions Philosophy gets lost in human fallibility. So we've got, um, uh, you know, bills to come in a moment. I I just want to try to sort of address one thing that you were were saying, Howard, which is this. I I do agree, um, you know, hierarchy is probably a bad word. I must confess I used that, um, you know, term myself in a paper I wrote, what, 15 years ago. Um, and, uh, you know, other colleagues have used it, you know, in papers that were written 20 years ago. So, so to some extent, uh, I, I, you know, I'm just like conforming to the norms there. I, I agree with Roman's point that perhaps it's the wrong image. But, but here's what I, what I do think about, about the lack of metaphysics. The point is that once you make a meta, metaphysical decision, in a sense, you've already predetermined the epistemology that that you that you take and i'll just give you a very simple uh, argument i'm not now debating about religion but let us suppose that you believe in god that there's a supernatural being that's uh, and I, i'm not talking about the details of god or how it operates the, just as a general proposition we imagine there's a supernatural being who's guiding everything right well that's metaphysics that's a metaphysical commitment right Um, if you make that metaphysical commitment, then a perfectly valid epistemology, a perfectly valid epistemology is divine revelation. You you can't quarrel with it. You read the Bible and you do what you're told. That's an epistemology. So so the point that I think Ronan is trying to make is that you have to kind of think about your fundamental um, uh, commitments before you can even start talking about epistemology or even ethics. It, if, if, you, if again, if you, if you, ethics is no problem. Ten Commandments. That's the point. On the other hand, suppose you don't think there's any kind of supernatural or uh, element that there is just quote nature. You know, that's your metaphysical commitment. We were talking about some scientists who think that, and therefore you know, get into determinism. Well, presumably your epistemology would have to 
uh, be some version of a scientific method. So I'm not trying to, uh, again, hierarchy perhaps is, is, is the wrong term, and I agree with you, but that's the kind of idea that you can't even intelligibly talk about epistemology. Um, with the realist turn, the realist turn is what's happened now, right, in the 21st century. The epistemological turn was 300 years ago. So I guess some of those people are thinking, uh, you know, it's time for a change. But that that that's debatable, <laughs> obviously. So, Bill, I, I, I'm sorry we've gone on so long, but you've been waiting. Thank you. I, I don't know. I don't know what is real Bill, because I saw balloons flying in your in your room. Is that are those real? Here, I saw balloons. Yeah. Oh yeah. If you go like, uh, hang on a second. If you go like this, uh, it might not work with Zoom, but you get. Uh, are you talking about real balloons or virtual balloons? I guess there were virtual balloons. <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, Apple, um, the latest Apple stuff has uh, things going on. If you make the appropriate gesture, you get uh, you get some. That's supposed to create balloons, but it's not right now. Oh, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> okay. 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 So if I go like this, I get. Uh, Fireworks, I think, if it picks me up. There we go. Oh, laser show. That's a laser show. Okay, anyway, so I must have uh, inadvertently made the gesture for balloons before. Um, so I'd like to get uh, I'd like to get somebody to outline some examples of uh, where um, philosophy sits above uh, or at the root of uh, some of the other sciences. Um, I see philosophy as sitting beside the other sciences um, and interacting with them and contributing to them, but also uh, pulling from them. So, for instance, we can't really talk about religion without talking about the evolutionary bi uh, biology um, uh, fear of death that is inherent in, in all animals, right? Um, we, you know, we really can't talk about, um, morality without understanding, um, contributions from biology, um, contributions from, um, uh, what kind of animal we are, right? I mean, if we'd, uh, if we evolved from, uh, a different branch of, uh, of, uh, the, the, the evolutionary tree, we may have very different sense of morality, right? Um, and, uh, so I don't, I don't see how we can just pull these things out of thin air, um, without having an understanding of where they're coming from. So I'd like to hear, um, what, uh, uh, some examples of where we might say, yeah, that's got to start with philosophy. It can't start with, you know, any other science. Hmm, that's a good point. Yeah. Uh, Ronan, did you want to answer well I mean, I have a couple of things to say, but uh... I, think, I, I think that um, for Gilson, a specialization um, sort of uh, creates a potential for disconnect. Um, he's very interested in the the whole person. And I think his argument is that philosophy has the potential to give us a sense of the whole and specialization is very important, but um, there, there, there is a potential disconnect. I mean, we do see it. You know, it's often mentioned how practitioners of medicine fail to see the whole human being. You know, they're so caught up in the science of medicine that they forget about the humanity of medicine. And I think that the argument that Gilson makes is that philosophy has the potential to bring the humanity back to the specialized sciences. And, and that's why it's fundamental um, because it. Well, in, in what, okay. So in what, what sense are you thinking that it would contribute there? Well, I think because it is so um, uh, non-specialized, that it has the ability to ask questions, human questions, and ethical questions, and 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 all sorts of questions about, you know, what it means to be human. 
like so the 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 goal is human flourishing um I, i'm not sure that some of the specialized sciences you know discuss um what it what human flourishing is you know we we do things like with technology for example because we can do it we don't always ask the question you know is this new te technological innovation going to contribute to human flourishing um i think that what gilson is arguing and and i do believe that philosophy as a whole does do this is it enables us to move in the direction of just being more human um because we can put a lot of the special sciences under the microscope of philosophy i don't know if i answered the question i'm not it's a great question i mean it is a it is a great question and, and it kind of puts philosophy at the center which is what you're complaining of about and and i i, he, I hear the complaint i i see what you're saying yeah um I, I just would like yeah to... i mean i I'd, I'd, I'd yeah we we'd need a justification for claiming that you know philosophy sits you know apart and and above or below depending on whether you're building or or you know straddling um other sciences or other knowledge streams um you know like questions of free will uh, you know even you, uh, you know you can't um you can't really I think actually philosophy does a disservice to free will because it creates a false, in my opinion, creates a false dichotomy before between absolute determinism and absolute free will. And I don't think that exists. I think free will is a combination of just everything that goes into you, right? Like who your parents were, whether you're uh, religious, whether you're practical, whether you're emotional, whether you're like, it's, there's so much in there that is, is not free uh that um that it's it's hard to say i have absolute one direction or the other right so it, it's it's to me it's clearly a mix so you know i i don't see how we can understand say a topic like, like free will without understanding you know human behavior that comes from social science studies that comes from yeah. you know evolutionary biology as i mentioned all that kind of stuff so i it's it's hard to say and john you were talking about having a you know, meta. You know, and what what are we talking about when we're talking about metaphysics? You you were saying we have to start with the metaphysics, and you use religion as an example. But you know, again, as I said, stated earlier, you can't even establish your metaphysics without understanding, you know, where we came from and what our social environment is, and and uh, what we're scared of, you know, and things like that. So, well, no, no, these are very good questions, and you know, interestingly enough, they anticipate, uh, you know, what. The way the structure of this program is is going to uh, evolve. Um, the short answer, I mean, it, it's difficult to give examples in a, a small amount of time, but the short answer is that metaphysics is supposedly uh, dependent on an axiomatic approach, right? So the, you, you set up certain axioms. We'll go into this in in details next time. Uh, you yeah, and up, I guess yeah. Perhaps, uh, sorry to interrupt. You, you but perhaps I'm. Yeah. Asking for those axioms, and maybe I'm premature here. Then, no, no. I actually, I'm I'm happy that you did, it's because what you're doing is you're actually sort of setting up. Um, you, you know, you're actually setting up where we're going with this, uh, and, and 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 the argument, roughly, I won't delay people's time with it. The argument, roughly, is that metaphysics is different; that it it has to be approached by a an axiomatic approach. One of the axioms turns out to be consciousness. So, um, and consciousness is a biological phenomenon. A subset of um, creatures, including ourselves, have consciousness. Uh, and the point is to engage in argument at all, you have to accept those axioms. Now, the other ones, special sciences, they have to adopt an epistemological approach. I.e., you, 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 you try to put a scientific method, you try to prove things. The point is that metaphysics is not amenable to that sort of thing and then the, the once you have done gone through the axioms right and you've come to sort of metaphysical conclusions what the um what the uh, the investigations of scientists be they biologists think of where Allah put the special sciences in the diagram i, I don't know if you've seen the diagram um mm -hmm. uh, 
those special sciences are discovering things about the reality, but basically they can't change the reality. Like, like in, in short, when when who, whoever Einstein comes up with a new theory, right, about space and time, it doesn't actually affect space and time. Space and time are always what they are. All Einstein is doing is is space and time are what they are. They've always been what what they are, and they will be what they are. All that an Einstein or a Newton or whoever myself in my own discipline, we're trying to figure it out. And we could be closer to the, quote, truth. That's another one around those questions, by the way. <laughs> um, you know, or not. Like, it, it, it's all sort of conditional, is the word. But, I mean, what I, what I liked about your approach is that you actually, in a certain level, have gone precisely to the heart of the matter. And that heart of the matter is what we have to... Um, sort out the same thing with the ethics uh, uh, you know uh, ronan mentioned the the human flourishing um you know be, if uh, an axiom is consciousness and if an axiom is that humans are conscious we're already humans and therefore by definition the the, the goal of philosophy is human flourishing or what aristotle would call it eudaimonia so we're, we, we are going to have a session on that type of ethics, so-called virtue ethics. But of course, there's a whole bunch of other ethics. And we plan to have another session on those other kind of ethics. Uh, religious ethics, uh, you know, the ethics of equality or equity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I just like the direction that you went with the questions, if I, if I can say. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. It's great. We'll just carry on. Will, you're up next. Yes, um, John, thanks. Um, my question is of a fairly general nature, and it's it's directed at you, John, and Ronan, and uh, Allah, and to the others afterwards. It's My question is, has any thought, or uh, as much thought, been given into why philosophers philosophize? <laughs> what is the basic objective of philosophizing? What is the, what are we inquiring about? And I could I could sort of start you off by saying my thinking is that sometimes it appears as though there's a specific issue under investigation. And some other times not. What What do you think, Ronan? Would you like to have a go, and then Alan maybe? That's that. That is a really uh, great and and very difficult question. I I do think that um, philosophy, the 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 need to philosophize, is a visceral need. It's uh, a need to understand, and it's rooted in curiosity. Um, it's rooted in, you know, asking fundamental questions like, why am I here? Uh, what is my purpose? Um, how did I get here? And, uh, you know, can I make sense of the world that I'm in, that I find myself in? Um, they're, yeah, they're I don't want to break you up, but, but that's so interesting there. And I see that as uh, quite a different story from say the philosophy of say economics where the, the the inquiry is specific rather than general i i think that even even in the philosophy of economics i think that there's a there's a fundamental curiosity that drives people to ask questions about the underlying assumptions or the the forces that are at play so it's not just about, you know, accepting a, a particular type of economic uh, worldview, but, you know, asking about, you know, why it is that we have a, that particular type of economic approach to reality and uh, inter interaction and, and uh, human exchange and so on and so forth. I, I think that there's something, there's a curiosity that drives um philosophical questions that may not drive questions in in other areas I, but that doesn't that, i mean that's not i mean i'm, I'm taking that back 
because like take Einstein as an example. Einstein, you know, formulated a theory about reality that, you know, the, the uh, special and the general theory of uh, relativity. But he was also a philosopher. I mean, he had a very philosophic worldview. So mixed in with his theoretical modeling, he also, you know, was driven by this fundamental curiosity about how nature works and and so on and so forth. And it, it drove him. I mean, it's just, uh, it's ineffable in a way, uh, Will. Okay. Thanks, thanks uh, so far. And any comments, John? Did you get the question? Did you? Uh, you need to unmute, John. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, I literally had to go for what is described. <laughs> okay. Feature. Okay. So, so um, Ala, uh, I think Ala's not here either. Um, oh, right. Okay. But um, fair, fair, fair enough. Let's let's not go back then. What I was what I was. What do you think, Will? Why, why? What I was wondering yeah. is whether there could be a split be between something that we call practical philosophy, where there's an objective, there's a clear objective of what we are inquiring, and something that we may call classical philosophy, where we're just, it's just inquiring either and thither and yon. We, we're looking, but we're not quite sure what we're looking for. Well, actually, it's that it, um, I think you're right that there's this fundamental split. I wouldn't put it quite like you. Um, you know, I've, I, there's two types of philosophy. You know, one is the philosophy that's taught in universities, and that's essentially a history of philosophy. Now, if you ever talk to a, a philosophy student who's done philosophy, what they do is they say, Aristotle said this, and, you know, Hegel said this. You know, it, it's almost never allowed to question the great Aristotle or the great Hegel. You know what I mean? It's just a... Yeah, it's, I, I, I'm with you. Um, then there's other people that do philosophy. And if you think about it, most of the people that were actually were philosophers, they probably didn't read a lot of other philosophers. They just sat on their own kind of thing, you know, and worked it out for themselves. Um, it, and I think that um, urge... Is I don't feel any particular urge to like read hit books in history, but I do feel an urge. I don't know about you to find things out. Do you know what I'm saying? Yes, yes. Well, yeah. that's, that's like, mm. in that way. Um, though there is another interesting argument that a realist philosopher per se would argue this: that there isn't really a split between philosophy and um, practical world. In order to engage in the practical world, you have to have, quote, the right philosophy, right? Um, uh, so whether you like it or not, if you're to succeed in the practical world, you have a philosophy, whether you've even thought about it or not. Right. The problem I think that most people would, would say is that most people's philosophy do not enable them to live in the practical world. That's also interesting there, John, because yeah. I, start, I, I started out by breaking my philosophical thinking into what I said there was classical philosophy and yeah. uh, practical philosophy. And yeah. then you mentioned uh, the way your, the university student would, what they would consider philosophy, which would be um, re reading up on Aristotle and the other philosophers, yeah. philosophers, right. which I would describe put in a third category. Yeah. And perhaps I would report it as philosophical thought. Yeah, history of thought. So you, there, there's a process in my view or my way of thinking of developing the thought. And it's done in two sections, um, practical, and uh, classical. And then when it's all reported, it's a different issue because that's documented. And then the interested parties can now go and discuss what's been written or what's been thought out. But yeah. the process of developing the philosophical thought is something different. Yes, yeah. So I, I, I just want to throw those out to everyone to 
get some feedback. Yeah, good, good. Um, so John, I guess, is next. John? John Cummins. Yeah, yeah, I'm here. So, um, yeah, it's so easy to get off into tangents, and I guess that's what this... The special right. sciences, you, you mm -hmm. might fear the special sciences might get us off into tangents and away from what maybe the Greeks understood as philosophy as the love of wisdom. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then what is wisdom? Is wisdom understanding the world as it is? Which maybe John Smith might say metaphysical realism takes us to. Or is wisdom... You know, we got to remember about the tangible and the intangible. And I always like going back to Irish Murdoch, who says man's a creature who draws pictures and then becomes those pictures. So that's the intangible. And perhaps philosophy, philosophy should be more, con more concerned with the imaginative pro uh, process you know, humanity is kind of an imaginative mm -hmm. thing. And and we can't forget how important our imagination is into creating the world we live in, which is maybe more intangible than physical. So physics will describe our physical world with math, mm -hmm. but maybe philosophy, real philosophy, should be dealing with the intangible and that's where real progress can happen new values new ideas that's what i think philosophy should be doing you see i think it has to deal with both and both equally you know that's the thing yeah you know art is important but your person drawing the picture also has to eat you see what i mean that's that's it's not either or. You have to have both. Ronan, did you want to comment on what John said? Yeah, but the intangible, John, um, the imaginative process, Einstein and everybody else trying to, the physics has helped us be able to eat better and everything like that. I would say the physical world, through understanding it, we're understanding it with our more of, with our imagination than anything else. That's what's helping us progress. Yeah. Well, did, did you see, interestingly, John, you're getting, you're an, anticipating, you know, what we're doing um, in future. And uh, you, you remember when um, uh, Sherman was di having all that talk about critical realism. And the key point there was, uh, it was called insight. Where does that imaginative insight come from? And there's a debate as to whether it comes, whether it's sort of transcendent or whether it sort of strikes you like as a bolt from the blue something or whether it, it is itself a process of reason. You know, so that's a very interesting debate. And actually that's, to some extent, it's the fourth uh, thing that we're discussing. But I would like Ronan to comment. I tend to agree with John on the importance of the imagination um, in um, understanding our place in the world and the nature of reality. I think that all philosophical ideas um, and all ideas in uh, the specialized sciences as well represent, um, you know, imaginative thinking. Um, and imaginative thinking does have a, a very uh, a specific impact in the world that we live in and, in, and, and on ourselves. You know, there's no deny, de denying uh, that. I, I really do think that you know, one way to th think of philosophy is like a story. I mean, it is a story in a way that we uh, tell ourselves. There's a certain narrative to it, um, but but it's a story. Even even what we're doing here now, um, you know, we're having um, a conversation where we don't entirely agree with one another, or we don't necessarily know where the other is coming from. You know, you're throwing out ideas that. That, are, that we are responding to and by being forced to respond to the ideas we're, we're perhaps elevating all of our ideas into a into some greater plane or a, a better place uh so it's a kind of dialectic and i think that all 
philosophy and all science for that matter kind of operates on uh, on that and it all requires uh, the use of the imagination mm -hmm. but is the individual creating or is the individual just discovering things you know the imagination is new ways to you know new ways to work things well I mean, I, I, I mean that's a that's a big question but yeah. I think I think we're doing both I, I think we are discovering but you know it takes a certain imagination to see things mm -hmm. um you know somebody finds a mathematical equation that all of a sudden they see elements of that equation in nature you know where does the where does that sort of mathematical proposition come from it comes does it come from the imagination does it come from some unconscious uh, perception of things in reality and then it's sort of percolates into a mathematical sort of idea like that's a hard question to answer yeah it is yeah well i'd like i'd like to say one more thing john like a book that had a profound effect on me was this uh the artificial ape mm -hmm. where the anthropologist uh, who wrote the book says claims um and he's through the anthropological record claims that we are more our biology has been now more de determined through our imaginative selves and the tools that we use because we're transforming our environment and that's changing our biology that's been mainly an imaginative process and that's what's changing us our brains are being reshaped our bodies are being reshaped because we're changing our environment with our imagination through tools from the very first time a monkey grabbed a, a rock and hit hit a walnut and took out the seed well that changed him evolutionary now he could live longer he could do this he could do that through tools now we're at the point of phones and data this this does change us yeah probably you know that's the imaginative part of us is changing us more than than the physics of the world or the natural laws of the world yeah. that's yeah. his claim and i think he might be right um, now, um, thanks, John. Um, we got more people. Iggy's bailed out, actually, unfortunately. Are you still there, Iggy? No, he's gone. Um, his Iggy's sort of complaint was that you know uh, people were going on too long. But I, to me, I like I like it. I like to, the conversation. Uh, you know, uh, you know, to keep going. Um, but we, Alan, what do you want to do? We're coming close to the end. You just want to. Take three questions from the remaining three. Ale, uh, unmute, please. Yes, please. And we have three to five minutes to maybe wrap it up, if you can. Yeah, so so maybe what could happen is Tori ask your question, Rick ask your question, um, and Henry ask your question, right? Did you have something else, Will, to say? Sorry, I meant to take my hand down. No. Okay. So, sorry, off you go. Okay, uh, I'll just just be quick. I just want to re re uh, state that we, this is a good conversation, and just kind of on Ronan's last point, where it's a dialectic, and that's almost a kind of scientific method, you know, a hermeneutic. It's an interpret. You know, there's 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 two kinds of knowledge. There's sort of the natural knowledge, natural science, and then there's the interpretive, uh, which is, I think, uh, in a sense, a, a evolutionary or historical development of this of the philosophical conversation of humanity up till now. Uh, anyway, um, I, I will. I'll let the others speak. Um, I, I, I don't. But I, I just some of the points. Bill's point about the evolutionary dimension uh, and some of the side by side. Uh, of, of scientific disciplines with philosophy. I think that's a good point. Will's point about the way I would point it, point it out is the practical philosophy versus the theoretical philosophy, not so much classic philosophy, but theoretical, because the scientific revolution is about putting together a, a theory of how things work. Um, John Cummins imagination. I think imagination is almost equivalent to saying consciousness 
Um, but we can talk in about that, but, um, and, um, um, anyway, uh, but I think like Ronan was saying that we're philosophy is, is necessarily a, a dialectic and a, a discussion. And it's not a, uh, absolute final, you know, end point of, of, uh, a, a theory of everything. A theory of everything is impossible. That's all. Yeah, Rick? Yeah, I just wanted to point out uh, one thing that Alice said about philosophy not being, or philosophy being important in uh, the uh, other sciences farther down the scale, like, philo like uh, psychology. If you look at extreme cases of uh, mental illness those people do have a metaphysical view of the universe that is completely at odds with what you and i would normally see someone with paranoia or paranoid schizophrenia they are extremely hard to deal with or to uh, treat because they are their uh, metaphysical system is so entrenched and they have a system whether it's right or wrong, they follow that, and it is extremely hard to treat because of that. Unless you can dig right into their met 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 metaphysics and find out, and uh, that reminds me of a uh, when I was taking a uh, philosophy or uh, psychology at university. One of the uh, professors was had an, an anecdote about. Uh, a patient at a men mental hospital who uh, had the delusion that he he was uh, Jesus. He kept saying, "I'm Jesus. I'm Jesus to everybody." And the uh, psychiatrist says, "Great. We, we we've got some carpentry work for you you here." <laughs> Henry, you have the last word, as indeed usually happens. Um, so I'm going to be quick. Uh, Will has mentioned uh, practical philosophy. My question is, how can we imagine philosophy being impractical? Because in my understanding, and I think everyone will agree, that uh, uh, philosophy is about understanding things and finding the solution to our dilemmas, and they have quite a few. So if philosophy is not applied to our way of life, to our behavior, to our understanding of things, what's the value of philosophy? It's it's just a shaking of the air. It's it's nothing. Philosophy must be practical. Philosophy must improve our lives. Philosophy is a way of life. And this is the whole value. And this is why philosophy can merge with the science, because science is looking for solutions. And philosophy does the same. Science applies solutions, and philosophy does. So that's the point. Philosophy uh, out of practice, I can't even call it philosophy. That's it. Hmm. A, a quick, a quick comment there. I was more or less thinking of the objective when you start. That's where the division. That's where I make the division, Henry. It's um. When you start out and you're clear about your objective, that to me is, is practical. When you can define where you are, where you want to go, and you can, at each stage, identify your progress. To me, that's practical. So it's a matter of playing with words, really. But the, the, So to me, that's clear. And then the other approach to philosophy is just a general inquiry. We don't know, we are not clear what we are looking for, but we are looking. Exactly. This is why I totally agree. But in order to define our objective, we have to understand. We have to come up to the clear understanding of things, and then we'll be able to define the objectives. We're not able to define the objective without understanding what the hell we are defining. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So do you want to finish it? John's got a question, but maybe John can stay till afterwards. So. Yeah, it's just a quick thing I want to say that philosophy, you know, equals wisdom. And maybe wisdom is, is to understand 
the world as it is, that's very important, but also as important is to un understand what, how, how the wor what the world could be like, the imaginative part of it, like what we could make the world into, not just as it is, but as the world could become. That's as important to philosophy as anything.